Few weapons command respect like an aircraft carrier. They are the largest surface warships ever built, symbols of the modern age of war. And yet, they have a secret. The modern aircraft carrier can't do its job without an essential piece of hardware that is 2,000 years old. In a message fragment from ancient Egypt, a deadly long-range weapon is described that relied only on the power of air. In the ancient world, the catapult was the technological front-runner in the arms race. It had the ability to store and release far more energy than a single man could possibly unleash. The stored energy is known as potential energy. Nearly all throwing devices use the same operating principle. They convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And the potential energy is either stored in some form of elastic, be it twisted rope, or elastic bands in the form of a handheld catapult. A trebuchet stores the energy in gravity by having the weights held up high. And all that happens is that you then release the potential energy and convert that into the kinetic energy that's in the missile. The standard catapult in the ancient world was the torsion catapult. Torsion catapult works by twisting up fibers which can retain energy while cocking the mechanism so that the arms of the catapult are actually linked up to the torsion and the trigger then releases all of that energy by unwinding whatever you've wound up. The materials used were animal sinew, hemp and stretched leather. Using only organic fibers, a common torsion-heavy catapult in the Roman army could unleash two and a half megajoules of potential energy, enough power to shoot a 130 kilo missile for over half a kilometer. But in 280 BC, in the Egyptian city of Alexandria, a new world-changing technology science was in its infancy. Once you go to using iron, it's a non-perishable material. You get a more reliable performance. You're not dealing with perishable sinews, hemp fibers. These are things that are going to deteriorate quite quickly in use. The ability to work metal to precision allowed the creation of airtight seals in pneumatic systems. We all now take in the modern world pneumatics for granted. All the buses and trucks that people travel in, um, they all have pneumatic brakes. Message fragments from ancient Egypt hint at the ambition to harness this power for war. The idea that somebody then harnessed pneumatics to make a, a missile firing device really stand out as a, as a bit of sort of advanced thinking at the time. Scientists today can use these ancient references to construct a model of the machine 2,000 years later. Their design shows one of the first pistons in history. The piston used by Tisibius is the first example of a piston. Uh, and if we can see one here, it's basically a cylinder with a loose end. And as we move the end in and out, you can see that it compresses the gas inside. When we compress the gas, the molecules of air are being forced close together, the pressure is increased, and they're desperate to get away from each other. This creates a force acting on the piston, trying to return it to its original position. If we release the piston, you can see that it pops straight back out. But will an early piston have enough power to launch a missile? Richard Windley has created a replica of the machine, first seen in the deserts of Egypt thousands of years ago. The arm from the piston comes out here, so that's the kind of thrust rod or connecting rod for the piston, and there's a large cam here which is connected to the actual arm of the catapult, which is pivoted a bit further back. As we pull the arms of the catapult, you can just see the cam's operating and pushing in the pistons. This is compressing the air and it's given us effectively a kind of air spring. This is achieved using only the power of what is all around us, air. The catapult would have shot 35 centimetre bolts with a wooden shaft and an iron tip. Fantastic, we actually hit the target first time. I was somewhat surprised, in fact, that um, we got the kind of range that we did. We were getting 40, 50 yards range with this, and the arrows are flying very, very straight. The actual height or trajectory is, is um, a slightly more complex issue, but it would be quite easy to get used to one of these things and probably hit a target of a metre square at um, 60, 70 yards. But if it was such a success, why did piston catapult technology disappear from the history books for so many hundreds of years? 
quite why they didn't use it, I think, is probably due to the fact that they had problems getting an air seal, and that is absolutely crucial. And, and that kind of um, unreliability in the field would, would make soldiers be very, very wary of it as a weapon. Had they perfected the air seal, the piston catapult would have become the elite catapult of the ancient world, capable of launching projectiles weighing several tons. This is what its successor, the modern piston catapult, does today. On an aircraft carrier, to launch a fighter plane, they use a steam cannon that actually fires the plane off the end of the aircraft carrier, and that really is sort of taking the idea into its final and most modern form. It gives us the capability to accelerate aircraft weighing 55,000 pounds from zero to 165 knots over a 300-foot distance in less than two and a half seconds. The principles explored by Tisibius save military lives every day. This is the front of the catapult. It's called the battery position. This is where the aircraft gets secured to the shuttle, which is attached to the rest of the catapult. Within the launching engine are power cylinders that run the full length of the catapult. Within the cylinders are pistons that are linked to the shuttle, which are next to the aircraft. When you're ready to fire the catapult, it's a programmed opening of the launch valve, which admits steam into the cylinders, pushes the pistons forward. When it gets to the end of the power stroke, the aircraft is permitted to continue flying. 